Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 136. When given an opportunity, deliver excellence and never quit. Robert Rodriguez. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my Indie Film Hustlers, to a special Sundance edition of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Distriber. If you guys are trying to get your movies or feature films or even shorts onto Netflix, Hulu, Google Play, iTunes, Fandango, or any of the major streaming services, Distriber finally lets you in without having to go through a traditional distributor. And you keep 100% of all the revenues and your rights. So if you want more information, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash sell my film. That's IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash sell my film. The show is also sponsored by Hollywood Camera Work. If you guys are interested in learning how to direct actors and become an actor's director, Hollywood Camera Work has developed an amazing master course called Directing Actors. And it is almost 30 hours. And I've taken this course. And it is by far the most comprehensive directing actors course I have ever ever seen. So if you want to get access to this course, head over to hollywoodcamerawork.com and use the coupon code HUSTLE to get 30% off. That's hollywoodcamerawork.com and use the coupon code HUSTLE. So guys, today we're getting towards the end of this special series. This is our second to last episode uh, and we have a great guest, a returning guest, our returning champion. <laughs> R.B. Botto from Stage 32. R.B. and I have become good friends over the over the year that since our last uh, conversation, which was an epic one, which was episode 29. I'll put it in the show notes, uh, which was a blueprint on how to make it to the film business. And uh, and R.B. delivered again, man. We sat down with Sebastian Tordaz, and uh, we 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 just had a ball and had a lot of information, a lot of knowledge bombs, a lot of stories. Uh, our Sundance experience, as well as a lot of great knowledge bombs for you guys. So, and I also wanted to talk about uh, Stage 32's first annual online film finance and producing conference. And I think it's a genius idea because a lot of times we go to these conferences, we buy the badges, uh, we get a hotel, we got to fly the plane, get a, you know get some new wardrobe, food, drinks, conference fees, all this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, you get all these not all this knowledge that costs you thousands of dollars uh, when these guys uh, with what stage 32 is doing, what RB is doing is they're creating an online film finance and producing conference. Uh, this is going to be a two days and 16 hours of very up to date and actionable information designed to help you navigate the ever changing landscape of film financing producing and raising money for your projects. And if you guys want to get 50 bucks off the conference, just use the promo code HUSTLE, all caps, H-U-S-T-L-E, HUSTLE. And for more information about the conference, just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Stage 32 Conference. That's Stage 32, C-O-N-F-E-R-E-N-C-E. So without any further ado, Enjoy our conversation with R.B. Bato from Stage 32. Hey, I'm Sebastian Tordaz. I'm Alex Ferrari, and we're here with the legendary R.B. Bato, uh, or Richard Bato, but we, friends call him R.B. from That's Stage32.com. How you doing, brother? Some enemies call me R.B. too. <laughs> usually, usually we'd like another adjective or something ahead of it, but yeah. I'm doing well. How you doing? Good, man. How you enjoying the, the fest, man? It's been unbelievable outside of the freaking snow never ending. It's been I, like 24-7 I've been telling people snowfall. it's like The Shining, isn't it? It is like The Shining. <laughs> it is actually like The Shining. Yeah. I'm expecting to find somebody like frozen by the side of the road. Right, or an, an, axe, an axe being wielded somehow. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. No, it's been the snow, this has been the snowiest Sundance I've ever experienced. And yes. you've been coming here? Longer than I care to admit. <laughs> Longer than I care to admit. I've seen a lot. So uh, tell, tell the audience a little bit about Stage 32. Sure, yeah. Stage 32 was launched in 2011. Uh, the best way we've been described, which is in a Forbes article, they called us LinkedIn meets Linda. Linda, of course, I'm assuming everybody knows who LinkedIn is. 
uh, Linder is sort of the biggest education site on the web. Um, LinkedIn ended up buying Linda for $1.5 billion, so we were very excited when that comparison <laughs> That's a made. very good comparison. That's uh, a very good comparison. We were very excited. And, and they actually made that comparison before they made that purchase. So even that was even nice. 10 15% of that, you'd be happy. <laughs> you know what? 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 
one of these directors uh, was really interested in making the film. He brought me to his manager, and his manager was David Greenblatt. Which is sort of famous because he was one of the original founders of Endeavor. Endeavor. Yeah, David Greenblatt, Ari Emanuel, they're the guys that kind of, you know, the, the legendary pimp move of going into... Tom the, Strickler and Rick Rosen. Yeah, and stealing the files. Not stealing the files, but taking the files in the middle of the night. I was literally there. When it happened. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So this you can is, tell the story. This it's is, great. This is silly, but uh, I used to be an assistant at ICM and I work, you, you work really hard there. And I was just out of film school at USC and I would just do anything for anybody. I, I did literally do the 12, 14 hour days. So I was often the last person there, but I was also extraordinarily naive and I still am naive in many ways, but uh, I was really naive back then. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I was used to taking a box <laughs> home with me at night or whatever, you know, and I was, I was walking <laughs> out and uh, there was one other guy there, which was odd because I'm like, you know, there aren't many people who stay this late and it was late. I don't remember exactly how late, but like yeah. the building was down. They were like cleaning and the light, a lot of the lights were out and we happened to walk into the elevator at the same time and I'm having a box and he's carrying a box and I'm like, oh, hey, how are you doing? He seemed very nervous. <laughs> And I don't want to say who it was. It wasn't one of the partners. It was one of their assistants. Uh, he seemed very nervous. And then we, we got out at the same, uh, it was like a two, three-story parking structure underground. Got out at the same place. And uh, our cars were like really close to each other. And he's like, oh, I was like, oh, well, let, me, let me help you. Like, I'll, you know, I'll help you, whatever. And he's like, oh, no, 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 I don't need any help. I said, I, I, let me know. I insist. You know, you've got actually more and heavier. About, I, I, I insist. I'll do it. And he's like, no, no, no. And I, I just kept pushing. And finally he opened his trunk, and then there was lots of boxes in the trunk. And literally, this is like, oh, I don't, I don't know. I wonder what's going on. Anyway, I, I drive in the next morning. There's security everywhere. They're checking everybody. And it was the night that they took all the files. But there was a buildup to that, too, because the other thing that was happening was that there were stacks and stacks of scripts. Back then, you photocopied scripts. Mm -hmm. And I used to send out a lot. Like the agent I worked for, uh, his name was Nick Reed, actually. And he became eventually head of Motion Picture Lit, and he won an Academy Award for a short film, The Lady in Number okay. t 12 or something. It was, it, was a, it was an interesting short film. Anyway, um, and I sent out more stuff than anybody else. And what happened was um, I noticed that he actually, his assistant was sending out more than me, but I was like, but usually wasn't there as late as me, like rarely, except for the night that obviously they took the stuff. I was like, how is he sending all this stuff if he's not here? So what they were doing, they weren't actually putting letters or anything mm -hmm. with the stuff because that takes time and you have to be there late to get all that out. They were just photocopying everything in the library. Wow. And you just realize it all in hindsight. Anyway, it was really cool because it was the, the beginning of Endeavor. Wow. Yeah, it was, I mean, sort of that pimp history, you know, story that people love to tell. And then they sold it to William Morris, of course. Well, now it's William Morris Endeavor. Mm -hmm. um, actually, it was the reverse. Oh, Endeavor, right. Endeavor took over Endeavor, right. Right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, listen, it's been five days. I know, six okay. days. I'm a little... I mean, that you're keep so David Greenblatt. I have the two active brain cells working right now. <laughs> no, you're doing great. Um, no, but it's, so David and I uh, met, and um, he uh, wanted to take me on, and uh, we bought the script to Covert Media. Paul Hansen runs Covert. Paul used to run uh, Annapurna for a while in QED. And Paul loved the script and uh, gave me a really nice um, option on it. And we've been piecing it together ever since. We have another, the director that was originally on board, we had to drop, unfortunately, not to any problem of his own or any, or any cause of his own. It was that he was a Canadian director and, and we really couldn't, I'm an American writer, so there's all these different things with putting together a Canadian production. So that was a little bit of a problem, but we attached another director, and now we're going through like sort of the machinations of, of uh, machinations of, of putting together the cast and who wants to work with who and who doesn't. It's it's a slog. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really, really is. People think that just you no. know because they're, they're financing no. the film, so it's not like it's a money thing. It's more that you're still piecing this thing together. The one thing about this independent movement that's really interesting is that um, the competition is going up for the same group of actors. So where you thought in the, or in the past where you could make sort of a nice little offer and you know, secure somebody for 20 days, 30 days, it's sort of like, well, now you got competition against 10, it's, and it's not always the studios that you're in, you're in competition. And with other indie films. And other indie films, and sometimes even, you know, now it's television too. Right, television yeah. and Netflix shows and it's all that crazy. Kind of stuff is, is taken up. Because there's only a limited amount of talent. I'll and that's it. And we've had actors that have been like, we absolutely love this script. We want to sign on. Can you do it in 2019? And we're like, 
No. Yeah. I'm not going to do it in 2019, but that's what they're tied up, you know, until. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, and they have all these other offers on the table. So it's it's been a very interesting experience. It's moving. It's, you know, it's, it's the pushing of the rock, proverbial pushing of the rock up the hill. And, uh, but it's getting there. Well, it's interesting to me that you didn't give up, that you, you, you started as an actor, you, you did become an entrepreneur to do the magazine, and then an entrepreneur again with this, and then you're still writing. I mean, so you're still, you've got the bug. I mean, you're, you're doing it. And you're not I, acting anymore, are you? I, you know, I actually just got offered something, but it is one of these things where the money would have to come in. Um, but they, you know, it's yours if you want it. And it'd be the, it'd be the type of thing that I would do because it's somebody I know. Okay. And it's not a, you know, it's like four or five scenes that it wouldn't be too yeah. demanding. Um, that's the type of thing that I would do it. But most of it has been on the business and, and the writing side. And, I, and to answer your question, the bug is I enjoy piecing things together. I enjoy that collaborative uh, experience of putting a film together. Uh, getting all the people together. The writing experience, it's interesting on, on this particular film I'm talking about with Covert, I'm just the writer, I'm not producing. Mm-hmm. Um, but yet, I'm being kind of treated like a producer because I know all the people that are involved. Right. And You're an overqualified screenwriter. Yeah, and it's, kind of, and, and it, it's nice to at least have your opinions heard sure, you know, sure, when sure. you're just, quote unquote, the writer. You right. Know what I mean? So it's, it's well, been writers have been historically well treated in Hollywood. Oh I mean, yeah, I know. I mean, I mean, I mean <laughs> let me just you know. <laughs> I, I think I, mean, I think there's actually <laughs> one of them on the Walk of Fame. I think one. I think there's one. If if anyone out there, I'm being sarcastic. If you don't understand, I'm being very sarcastic. I think there's one. So, so there, are, there are some, but you there are yes, yes, top, of course, top elite, which yes, is like ten writers in the whole business. Of course, oh, it's crazy. So uh, you and I both have very unique perspectives because we work with independent filmmakers mm-hmm. and people trying to break into the industry all the time. And they contact us and all that kind of stuff. What can you what can you say about the wrong way to try to connect or make a relationship with someone in the business that might be able to help you, might be able to give you some information, might be able to open a door? What's the right way and what's the wrong way? That's a because great question, it, by the it, way. Because <laughs> I know most of the people listening to this don't understand the right way because I get abused on a daily basis. I'm sure you do. My God, you have a whole social network. Yeah. That you, I'm sure you're getting hit up all the time. So what's the right way and what's the wrong way? Well, I mean, 90% of the people come in from a me perspective, right? Mm-hmm. It's about me. I have this great script. I have this great idea. I'm a great actor. Yeah, you and everybody else, okay? <laughs> right. You and everybody else. The question becomes, how do you differentiate? How do you stand out amongst the pack? And it's not the work at first because you got to get people to actually read the work or see the work. How do you get them to want to do that? And the way that you do that, of course, is by being selfless. You need to be out there making it about the other person and not about you. So social media, for example, this is the mistake people make all the time. Like, you know, people will hop on Twitter and every post is me, me, me. People come into stage 32 and, you know, you get my welcome message and they'll say, I have a screenplay, I have a this. And I'm like, I don't know you. What can you do for me? You should read this. It's great. No, I shouldn't. Okay. Or I love, this is my favorite that I get every once in a while, (laughs) is, you know, people respond to the welcome message and they'll say, I can't, you know, I'm interested to see what this, what, what this can do for me in my career. And I'm like, wow. and I'm like it's not going to do anything with you for you in your career if you think like that. It's you get out, look, this is the easiest way to put it. You get out what you put in with everything in, in life and in, in this business especially. This is a relationship business. Everything stems from relationships. Mm-hmm. The way that you create relationships is by being selfless and asking people questions about them. Like I always say, here's three entryways into social media, for example, right? People are always like, well, if I'm new to the business, why do people want to listen to me? And I said, okay, well, the first thing you can do is if you really want to approach somebody, which you can on social media, and you can at events like this, by the way, mm-hmm. is ask questions about them without being creepy. Ask questions, you know, <laughs> like, you know, about... <laughs> You know, no, I, I get you the know creepy what I'm part. saying. Yeah, we all do about yeah, the creepy part. Don't yeah. be creepy. You know, come in with something of value and something that makes them go, "Oh wow, like you actually took the time to do some research." Or that's a really kind of uh, off the beaten path kind of question that I'd be happy to answer. Maybe it's about their creative process. Why would you do this? Why would you pick that? I'll actually tell a quick story if you don't mind in a minute. Sure. But but that's the first way is the question, right? The second way is sharing content. Show people what you're interested in. If you know, you first of all, you should be reading the trades every day if you want to be in this business. You have to know what's going on in the industry. It's your job. It's also your job to network, by the way, every day. Um, I don't like that word, by the way. What's that? Network. Network. You don't like network. Um, you know, I don't like catchy words like that. I mean, I, I yeah, do, but I it, because because it makes it sound like it, it's a job to network. It's more about um, 
being uh, cordial, social, just building relationships. Or okay. fr- I don't even like the word relationship. Building friendships with people, but authentic yeah. friendships. Totally agree. I use networking, obviously, because it's a networking site. We call it networking. But what I, what I mean by that is that you have to be able to organically get people to want to be in your life. Yes. And, and it, when I say treat it like a job, the reason I say treat it like a job, because it's no different to me than the craft. The second that you say to yourself, I want to become a writer and you're really serious about it, or I want to become a filmmaker, you're working on it every day. You have to put yourself out there is what you're saying. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And, and same thing with networking. The second that you sit there and you say, it is my job to build these relations or friendships or whatever it is, then I'm going to go do it. I'm going to dedicate the time. I mean, as busy as I am, I spend at least a half hour every day working the site, working Twitter, working everything, because it matters. You know, and, and a lot of my great relationships have come from that. Mm-hmm. So I was saying the second thing is sharing content because it shows people a little bit, it gives people a little bit of an insight about you. Mm-hmm. What do you like? What are you reading? What's important to you? What did you find interesting? And, and the third thing is just compliment people. Say, if people are like posting great content that you've had an interest in, don't just sit there and read it and say, wow, that was great. Let them know that you appreciate it, that you appreciate that they shared it, that they, you appreciate that they took the time. Those are three very, very simple entry points to any conversation, any social media strategy, anything. Well, you think about it like a friendship. Because it's, it's a friendship. You're trying to have a friendship. Well, I mean, well, the way we met. Absolutely. I the mean, way, it's 100%. The way we met was... Um, I had heard about Stage 32, I had a podcast, and I tweeted you. That's right. I tweeted you, I'm like, hey man, love what you're doing, mm-hmm. Loved, would, you, would you like to come on the show? Yeah. So what did that say? The first entry point, I complimented what he's doing, mm-hmm. uh, and it was authentic, it yeah. wasn't BS, I, I, I compliment what you're doing, I know you've done podcasts before because I've done research, so I know this is not a, a unique situation, I'm like, hey look, this is my podcast, Here, what ca- I'm offering you my audience, I'm mm-hmm. offering you something, so I'm offering some value to you. Mm-hmm. And you learned, and I'm sure when you looked, you looked up, and you're like, oh, sure, let's do it. And you probably listened to a podcast or two of mine. Absolutely, I did. Yeah. And then you're like, okay, cool. And then that's how this, re- and that was what, a year ago now? Maybe even a little, yeah, maybe not. Well, yeah, you were one of my early podcasts. Yeah. That's how you and I met, too. And that's how, <laughs> well, no, we met, we met the other well, way. the same thing, but I reached out to you. Yeah, you reached out to me, exactly. So, but that's the, that's the way. And I always, I always go into it with value. Yeah. You have to provide value to whoever you're going to. So mm-hmm. if like, because I was the other guy. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you ever were that other guy, but yep. I was that desperate. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, what can you do for me? What can you do for me when I was younger? Because that was all, you know. You know, and you could smell that. Yeah. Oh, and that's it. I mean, you can smell the desperate energy when you like when you when you, like. I mean, I remember I was here ten years ago and I, I snuck into a party. I had Harvey in front of me. Harvey Weinstein, and you run up to Harvey, hi, Harvey, how you doing? And like, Harvey's like, Jesus Christ, Yeah, kid. you and everybody else. Every, exactly. You're the 50th person doing it to me today, that, if not in the last five minutes. Exactly. So, and it, it doesn't get you anywhere, as opposed to trying to provide a value, whatever that value might be. And mm-hmm. it's something as simple as, um, if you're creating a social, like your Twitter account, yeah, um, posting things that are entertaining, educational. Uh, things about you that are entertaining, educational, what you're into. Mm-hmm. And that's how you start building up that brand. Well, and you, bu- you build up your social currency, you build up all of it. And, you know, the look at me approach never works. I've never seen it work. You know, it's, it's the same thing with crowdfunding. You know, the... the oh, the you, begging. Well, if, if, just even the if you build it, they will come mentality. No, I don't care how great your film is. Maybe you've written the next great American film, but nobody is going to care if they don't know you. Nobody's going to know that because they're not going to, you know, get there. I mean, a perfect example. You said how we met and everything mm-hmm. like that. Now, this relationship over the last year mm-hmm. has grown and grown. We did an Oscar thing together. You know, we helped each other out. Are we going to do another one, though? Of course we are. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm actually thrilled about the nice. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the nominations because last stage. Yeah, they stage, just came out today. That's last great. stage thirty two is involved, which was really cool. Okay. I'm learning more by the minute, but um, uh, you know, and then we did panels together. Like, and, and then we look out for each other. It's like, hey, there's a panel coming up. Do you want to be on that? Hey, would you be interested in doing this? And then it led to, and here's, here's the kicker, because this is what we're talking about. Like, ultimately, at the end of the day, right, you're getting people to be champions of you and your work, and people that are going to give you honest feedback, and people mm-hmm. are going to be there for you. A couple weeks ago, Alex sets me up. He's got his new film that he, he did, and he said, hey, would you watch this? And of course I'm going to watch it, because mm-hmm. we built up that relationship. Right. And of course I'm going to help in any way I can. Mm-hmm. But see how that happened over a year? But that's the thing, and, yeah. and, and it took time. This is a mm-hmm. long... Relationships aren't built in a month. Yeah. It takes time, and it takes work, and, and it's, it, but it takes time. And, and, and that's the one thing that I want everyone listening. It's, it's a long play. 
It is a long it's play. It's a long play with all relationships. I mean, when we started. Yes, I agree with everything you guys are saying, but I would just say, think of it in an authentic way. No, no, absolutely. Well, can, I tell, can I tell my story? Go ahead. Because, But now I'm going to put a little caveat or a little, you know, this story is actually in my film crowdsourcing book that's coming out later this year. So just because I'm you telling you. What's the You've book? You've been talking about this book. No, 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 it's done. Your, is it's it, fine, is it done? No, it's there. Are you serious? Oh, yeah. Is it okay. real? It's, it's finished. Okay, fine. Well, yeah. good. <laughs> so I got, yeah, Vocal Press asked me to write a book on film crowdsourcing, I think, in 2014. It's finally yes. in. He started with MySpace, so I had to yeah. update, he had to update <laughs> that chapter. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this in 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 the book there is this because there's a lot about networking. Because you know, right, right. the whole book is on crowdsourcing, which you know has an element, of course, of marketing and networking. Mm-hmm. But I tell this story, and I'll tell it quick. But it, you know, the Austin Film Festival mm-hmm. is a screenwriter centric festival. It's the only real film festival that is uh, where the conference is specifically for screenwriters. Matt, so Dye, I go down, Matt Dye runs it. Matt Dye is this yeah, the story? Yes. Yes, I have a great, great story. Great story. Great story. Yeah. Because this will speak to. It speaks. Idea, it's an excellent you know, story. Um, so anyway, I've, I've been down there as a writer, and I've been mostly down there over the last few years as a speaker. And it, the cool thing about the Austin Film Festival is that the screenwriters that they bring in, I mean, they bring in some great people. Mm. They hang around. I'm talking about, like, you know, the Shane Blacks and the Lawrence Kasdans. And the, I mean, like, these people hang around at the Driscoll Bar every night, and they're approachable, okay? Approachable. Now it's all about approach, right? So one night, I'm not going to name who the, the director was, but he's won a bunch of Academy Awards. He's written some of the top grossing films of all time. He's also written some very small indies that did okay. Him and I had kind of forged a little bit of relationship over the course of a couple of years. And we were both sitting on a couch and uh, having a drink. And all of a sudden, like one of the conferences, one of the uh, panels let out. And now here comes all the writers into the bar. Mm-hmm. And he looks up and he goes, oh, here we go. And he goes, <laughs> and, you know, this is a... Kind of caustic, you know. F- he's been around the business forever, so you yeah. know, that he knows certain- exactly what's going to happen. And he's got that certain level of cynicism that only comes from having so many years in the business. <laughs> like you know what I mean? It's like, but 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 still wants to help. Yeah. And so he he stands up, and he says, "Okay, here's how we're going to do this." He said, "One at a time. The one person comes forward. The next person stands at least ten feet back because he didn't want the people in line overhearing his conversation with the first person, right?" So I'm sitting there, and the first guy walks up, and I'm not even, I mean, right out of central casting with his swagger and his crap, and his, you know, and he's, he he's walks, and you could see before word comes out of his mouth that this is not going to end well. <laughs> and it's just not. Or and, start well. Or start well. Or start, be well at all, sir. It's not going to be well at all. And the first words out of his mouth, he goes, hey, how you doing? He goes, uh, you know, so I wrote this. He didn't even say hi. Like, he was like, you know, I said, how you doing? He goes, I wrote this script. Da, 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 and, 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 you, and, you, and now the director... I mean, it was hysterical. He starts looking around the room. He's checking out Sports Center on the TV. He's taking a sip. He says to the waitress, he's like, you get me? while the guy's talking, okay? And the guy doesn't stop. He doesn't hesitate. Like, none of this is phasing him. It's, it's wow. freaking incredible, right? And I'm giving the very short version of this, but he, at one point, he finally says, so what do you think? And the director went, oh, I'm sorry. Were you talking to me? He goes, I, I wasn't sure with that whole thing. And he said, um, and he takes his, his hand out. He goes, um, and he said his first name. And he goes, you see, he goes, you asked me if I'm interested in your script. He goes, I'm not interested in your script, and I'm not interested in you. Horrible approach. Who's next? So now this girl comes up. Now, she didn't hear any of this, okay? Mm-hmm. And again, I gave the short version, the clean version of that, because it was a little nastier. Oh, but th- th- was there a little interaction there? Uh, no, 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 no. He was like he was stunned. stunned. Like he was stunned. Like, I mean, he was like, you know. Um, she comes up and very kindly says, nice to meet you, the whole thing. And the first thing that she asked him, she said, can I ask you a question about, and she asked him about his biggest flop. Hmm. It was an indie that crashed. I mean, really bad. And... He said, she said, there's a scene with the actor and the actress when they're having an argument in the kitchen. She goes, and something just told me that maybe that was improv or maybe you went through a couple of changes with that because it's such a pivotal scene. And he was so taken by that. He goes, first of all, he goes, that's amazing that you asked me that question. He goes, second of all, you're very astute because that was the hardest scene for us to film because I probably wrote it 30 times. And he said, and the actress said to me one time, because it just wasn't working, said, can I take a shot at it? And he goes, and that's the, you know, the shot we used in the film. And he said to her, he goes, why, why that film of everything I've written? And she said, to me, it was the most personal thing you've ever written. 
And they went into this whole conversation, and he said to her, what do you do? What do you write? Tell me about you. At the end of this conversation, making this whole long story shorter, he reaches into his back pocket, and he pulls out a card. And he says, and it's got all his information on it, home phone, everything. And he says, I bring three of these to this festival every year. He goes, if I hand out one, he goes, I usually go home with all three. He goes, you send me your favorite script. You call me. He goes, and I'll do what I can to help you. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. He ended up helping her work on the script, brought her to his manager, his agent, got her signed. He bounces ideas off of her now. That's the friendship that they've built over the last three, four years. Hello? Okay? Great. Approach. What's the difference between guy one and guy one and girl one? Approach. And, That's it. And it wasn't like, and look at what she, the, what, when we, he, she led with value, but it was, a, it was an interest in him. Mm-hmm. And that he, she had done the research, mm-hmm. and, she was, and, and she showed true, authentic interest in what he was doing in a way that's not like very common or anything like that and that was the connection well for pitch meetings i've been on the other side of that table where i'm hearing the pitches too and I, we talk about this in class but not just for pitch meetings also if you're going to interview with an agent or a manager um because they've read your script and they want to meet you um or before they've even read your script perhaps you might be able to meet them 50 50 it's chemistry uh and then what the script is chemistry meaning meaning do they Oh, do they like you? And do you like them? Um, because you're going to be spending so much time working together. Oh yeah. And you, you know, they, they want to, um, they really want to like you and they want to help you because there, there's even an authentic thing there. So it's really important. Just that chemistry, just the, the idea that you actually like each other is a, is a huge thing. Yeah. That, that's half of it. Oh, I totally agree. And if they see that you're egotistical and, and protective and, they're going to know that you're going to be a pain in the ass. You know oh, yeah. I mean? That you're not going to want to take notes. You're not going to want to. So it is a lot about chemistry, and it's about knowing your space in the room and, and your place in the room at, at certain times, you know? But again, it all comes down to approach, and it all comes down to knowing who you're meeting with. Like, I've had so many people that have gone on general meetings that will tell me afterward, man, I wish I would. I didn't realize that they did that movie. And I'm like, how the hell could you go into the meeting and not know that? That's research. It's basic research. Basic research. It's so much easier now. Yeah. Yeah. When we started, we couldn't, it wasn't easy. You couldn't find that information. It was a little harder. So now there's no excuse though. I mean, you could literally type up, you know, minutes before the thing. Yeah. In the waiting room, you could do it. That's true. And I mean, but it's the same. I mean, look, we we have services on the site, um, you know, with pitching. And it's really interesting to me sometimes when I, when people will come and they'll sign up for like a pitch session with a producer that does like horror and they're pitching oh, a Jesus. comedy. Yeah. It's just, and ridiculous. it's like, it's, it's right there. The research is, I mean, the information is right there. There's no excuse. You have to know, you have to know. And people, cause people get pissed off with that. It's like, you know, it's, it's, I'm giving you my time, right? Your biggest commodity, most valuable commodity it's is time. your time. So if I'm going to sit in front of you and you're going to come, and I'm not saying me, but you're a studio executive or a manager or whatever, and, or somebody you know, you're trying to raise money, you know, even. I've seen that where it's incredible. They don't know the people that they're asking. You know, they're asking people for money and they don't know about them. And it's just amazing. And it's, if, if you're not doing that, then you know, you've lost the battle before it, start, before it started. You know? so, these again, are, but these are basic things, but most people don't understand think. it. <laughs> People well, people are, but look, I, I, from the other side, I understand the other side. People are nervous. You know, they yeah. think you have oh, to go, yeah. blah, 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 blah. We've and all been there. Yeah. And, and it's just something you also you learn. We're trying to tell you now <laughs> that, you know, don't make that mistake because, you know. It takes time. It but, takes yeah. time to develop. I mean, it took, it took me 20 years to finally feel comfortable in my own skin to just go, you know what? I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And if it doesn't work out, I'll just go on to something else. And with that energy and that kind of mentality, it's amazing the stuff that's happened to me over the last year, year and a half, yeah. ever since I launched Indie Film Hustle. It's purely because I just like, you know what? I'm just going to do me. Yeah. And you're the, you're the same. I'm just going to do me. And just like, fuck it. Yeah, I mean, it is what you see, what you get kind of thing. And it's... It's, you it's know, authentic. It's and, authentic. And that's the thing that... Well, your personality comes through on your site. Yeah, no that's, doubt. It's like having a voice. Like, right, they're always saying writers have to have a voice or directors have to have a vision. Mm-hmm. Your personality comes through. That's actually the most important thing. Mm. I've just gotten to know you, and I, yeah. I hope to get to know you better. But sure. it's, when you notice that personality coming through, 
That is the most important thing in this business. No doubt. And, mm-hmm. you, and you have that in spades. And you see it. You even see it in, the, in your film. Mm-hmm. You can see how people, you know, responded to you. You could tell. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. I didn't see a behind the scenes thing, but you could tell. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I mean? Thanks. The way that you let the actors riff a little bit and everything like that, you, you, you could see. And then, of course, I got to speak to um, Jill. Meg herself. Yeah. <laughs> Jill. Meg herself. And, um, and she said the same thing. Like, that freedom and that creative freedom. But, you know, that's trust and that's all. I mean, again, it's just being you. It's being authentic. One of the reasons why when you sign up for Stage 32, you get a message from me. That was a decision made before we launched. Believe me, I, it's not that I wanted the extra correspondence. And I, <laughs> it's a lie of all this time. 500,000 or plus. <laughs> you know, I, so please, don't write me. No, I'm only kidding. Um, I'm only kidding. Uh, but, you know, I, we, the idea was I wanted people to know immediately, yeah. this is who I am. I am just like you, Okay. I'm scratching and clawing like you are, okay? You know, and people say to me, like, oh, my God, you've had all, you, all these things you've had. must be so easy. It's never easy. No. And it's never easy. Spielberg couldn't get money for Lincoln. Look at Scorsese. Spielberg, Scorsese Look, couldn't get money silence. for silence. Are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. It's, it, it's always a scratch and claw. But what always. I wanted to do is I wanted to take that, you know, we're, we're creatives, so we're cynical by nature, I think, mm-hmm. Okay. So you sign up for a site like this, you know, some people are like, why do I need this site? I can have your Facebook, you know, it's whatever. Or is this going to do anything for me? And whatever. So I wanted there to be that message to say, hey, you basically, like we said earlier, you, you, I built it for you, but you got you know, to put in the time and the effort. But here's what, if, it, if you do, this is what's going to happen. Do you agree with the statement that, and I've said this many times in the, before, that filmmakers, screenwriters, creatives in, in our industry mm-hmm are easily some of the most cynical people on the planet. I, I think there's no question, and I think, but you know, I think it comes from, look, it's a hard, it's a Because very, of the beating. It's that, the beating. It's the beating that we get on a daily basis, year after year, like, oh, the money's gonna drop for this movie, or I'm gonna get you this job, and, or people just talking crap, and then nothing ever happened. You become cynical, like when, you're, when you walk in, you're just like. But you have to push through, you have but to you create. Ha- but it, you have, you to, have to keep pushing. It's easy to. not to create. It's so much easier. Do you think I like doing all the work that I do on any film hustle every day? Yeah. You know, yesterday we just put, I put out that podcast with Elijah Wood and I'm like fucking like half asleep and I'm just trying to like, because I told my audience I was going to do it right. and I want to get it out there. I want to help them and all that stuff. It's, it's not easy. I'm sure you're the same way. I can imagine the, the workload you go through with State Story 2 and trying to be a screenwriter and trying to do all the stuff that you do. Yeah, no, it's insane. I mean, it's completely insane. It's overwhelming and, you know, it is, you know, a lot of times 18, 20 hour days and, mm-hmm. you know, but there is a responsibility and a commitment that, you know, you've, made to your audience in a lot of ways that you're going to this is the quality you're going to provide this is the information you're going to provide mm-hmm. but if you take that away if you take the stage 32 part of it away and we you know stick on the creative side i think the cynicism comes from a few different things i think that some people again with if they come in with this idea that they're fantastic and they've written the great first <laughs> script or that their filmmaking vision is unbelievable yeah. or you know they i'm gonna win the oscar next year yeah. right the acting yeah, yeah, and you yeah, know yeah, and, yeah. and, and if you come in with that kind of attitude, you're going to get shot down so quickly. Oh. The, the cynicism is going to even rise higher because, you know, and then, but then there's also this learning curve of being able to take criticism. Like, you know, I even did this. I, I mean, I had the experience of reading scripts and seeing screenwriters and, and playwrights get beaten down. Mm-hmm. And I still, when I wrote my first screenplay and I got feedback, I was mm-hmm. like, these people don't know what <laughs> are you kidding me I'm a genius I'm like you know how did all three of these people covering the script completely miss the point these three people are idiots I mean it took me a while to sit there and go okay I'm not a freaking genius my first script sucks and I have to figure out a way to you know accept notes and you know and accept and parse and digest Again, and that's a big thing in this business too I also think that cynicism comes from the fact that too many people that are just starting out count on their peers at the same level. So mm-hmm. it's good to network with peers at the same level because you never know who, you know, no connection is a bad connection in my mind. Okay, you never and know. They, and they can help you do things. You never know, and they can yeah. help you do things. But I see screenwriters all the time, for example, and I see filmmakers do this too, and I see actors do it with their reels. They'll go to, like, will you, I use screenwriting so often, I'll use acting as an example. You know, if you're just starting out and you're building up your reel and you're showing that reel to somebody else that's just starting out and this and they're going, oh my God, it's brilliant. You know, but meanwhile, it's like eight minutes of you doing one monologue and it, you know, we're like trees in the background or some shit. And, you know, and, and you're like, oh, it's great. I've seen you that know. one. Yes, it's good. 
<laughs> it's good. It needs to be edited by seven and a half minutes. Yes. But, <laughs> but it's, you know, but it, they, that is a problem. So, like, I've seen threads on stage 32, for example. We just had one recently on the screenwriting side. And it was this big argument about how do you invest in yourself? Because I talk about this all the time. Mm-hmm. And people are like, well, I don't have money to spend on notes. I don't have money to go get headshots. I don't have money. And I'm like, well, wait a second. Think about all the stuff you spend money on. Do you buy five dollar lattes every day? Are you out with the boys or the girls partying three times a week? Okay, you're buying your clothes, you're you're this, buying your clothes. What are you doing? What are you sacrificing to get yourself in a position where you can get the proper feedback and the proper information to shorten the path and shorten the road, as opposed to going to your peers? Because you know all these people in this thread were like, "We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor." And now back to the show. Well, I have screenwriter friends and, you know, they, they tell me and I'm like, have they has sold, anything anything? sold anything? Have they had anything have they wrapped anything? Well, How many scripts have they written? Well, they're on the first scripts too. Okay. Well. <laughs> it's the equivalent of asking your mom. It is the equivalent. For, hey, what do you think of my movie, mom? Hey, what do you think of my script, mom? Oh, it's not you. And that is honestly some, some great advice because when you are starting out, you show, man, you show your short films to your friends. Mm. And all of them are like, even if they're in the business or not, they're like, oh, that was really great. That was really great. Yeah. And then you submit to 20 festivals and all the festivals are like, yeah, not so much. Not like, so much. Why are these guys all missing the point? Yeah. Where you have a relationship, a mentor, or someone who's a bit ahead of you in, in, their, pro, in their journey that can give you that advice. Well, this cycles back to where you guys started. You have to pay it forward. No doubt. Yes. Oh, my God, no doubt. Absolutely. Kevin, Kevin Spacey said it the best. If, you, if you've reached the top floor, it's your job. And your obligation to send the elevator back down. Yeah, it's true. And it's very true. And that's what you were saying, where you have to give something. You have to want to give people something, too. So, yeah, it's important for people as they're moving up to help people who are behind them. Well, yeah, and it's also important, though, for people on the ground floor, because you can get back even, even if you learn something. Like I said, or if yeah. you see an art, somebody yes. posts an article that you like, go share that article. Put good out there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Let other people see it. And, yes. you know, there's, there's a way to... There's a way to be involved all the time. Mm-hmm. There's something for you to be doing all the time. Um, there's a place for you all the time. It's just that some people sometimes feel you have two types of beginners. You have the beginners that are very, very anxious to find those mentors and understand that. And then you have those beginners, like we were talking about, that feel like they know best. And, you know, the, but, and I see it all the time on stage stage because I see the people who accelerate. And I see the people who end up selling stuff or putting something into a festival and it does well and everything. Mm-hmm. And those are the people that came in humble. They came in looking for advice, you know what I mean? Looking for people that could help them. But they also gave, you know, they, were, they participated. Can you talk about some of the successes of Stage 32? Well, yeah. yes, I can. Because well, it's Oscar Day. <laughs> we have, uh, it's awesome. I have one uh, Stage 32 member. He's a producer. Uh, he has two nominations. He nice. is nominated for Tony Erdman for Best Producer, and he's nominated for My Life as a Zucchini for Best Animated Film. Awesome. Uh, another, uh, par- another Stage 32 was also a producer on My Life as a Zucchini. He had uh, the one that, the first one I spoke about had four films in competition this year at Cannes. He won for L at the Golden Globes. He has been instrumental. You talk about giving back. He has not only hired a bunch of stage 32ers throughout this entire process, um, he mentors where he can. Mm-hmm. He was instrumental in us being at Cannes, being part of the Next Pavilion, mm-hmm. which is the, mm-hmm. the whole of emerging uh, tech and uh, entertainment companies. Um, he's been fantastic, but he's a perfect example of a guy that's you know, at the top of the mountain that gives back all the time. Uh, we found out, or as of right now, I don't know, still, we're still getting the counts. 13 other Stage 32 members wow. are either nominated or worked on films uh, that are nominated. So that's pretty cool. That's insane. Um, yeah, I mean, we have, we've had so many success stories. And do you have a, do you have a screenwriting com- contest? Yeah we, have, yeah, we have a few of them. We, well, we do a couple like? of fellowships. Again, our screenwriting contest in the beginning, I was reluctant to do them at first until we had the relationships that I wanted. So our, our, the first one we actually did was a horror one. And the reason we did that was because we had great relationships with horror producers. Mm-hmm. And uh, the top three finalists are in production on, um, on their films. They all got deals. In, Is this and the Bloodlust? This was, we did it with the Bloodlust the first year. We don't do it with them anymore. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, Although I think it's, no, it's not called the bloodless, it's the search for new blood. It might, it might yeah. have changed. But the first year we did it with them. Um, 
our, our main one has been fantastic. There, you know, it's a, we have one with, that has a fellowship attached to it as well. We've done some other genre ones, but we only do the genre ones if we're really working with people that are, you know, really anxiously looking for that material. Mm. So everything that we do, we, and this is the saying within the company, is about access and opportunity. Mm-hmm. Nothing that we put out there um, where you have to spend even even our even our coverage services. The whole idea between our coverage services and everybody else's is you literally go and pick the executive. So you know exactly who's covering your script. Hmm. You know what, like if you have a sci-fi, we have a list of people working in the sci-fi space. You can go pick that person. And then you have the option to have a phone call with them, which is incredible. Well, two of my friends actually worked for you, I think, and they they were executives in the business. And also one was a really good writer, which I think Charlie Charbonneau has worked with. Oh, yeah, Charlie's great. And then um, who was a writer on various Kevin Williamson shows, like yeah. the originals, things like that, and, um, and also uh, Jason Murch. Oh, Jason. Uh, Jason was right, but Jason's a great guy. Yeah. A great guy. And Charlie, both of them were also educators for us. So yes. not only listening yes. to pitches and not only doing the coverage services, mm-hmm. but we They've also- been in the business. Yeah. I mean, we also really? offer all education, and the mandate for our education is that you have to be working at it right now. We're not going to provide you with dated material. We actually just launched two uh, online conferences. We're doing a film finance conference and a screenwriting conference. Two-day events, completely online. And the reason why, again, I get to speak at a lot of these things. And I feel like I speak on panels sometimes, and the people that are on the panels with me, you know, they did it 20 years ago. And I feel like, you know, you spent all this money on airfare, hotel, the new wardrobe, yeah. you know, meals, Drinks and and of course a ridiculously priced badge sometimes. <laughs> I mean, I was on one screenwriting panel. I literally, I it was, I, I, it was four guys. I swear to you, none of them have worked in the business since '97. And they're putting out advice about the business today. Well, they're not in the business, but, and it's not, and it's not, relevant. it's not relevant. And I actually was sitting there silent. And, and the moderator is a very good friend of mine, and she, you know, I, she says, "I've never seen RB." so quiet he hasn't like I was a half hour I hadn't said anything and I and she was like what do you have to say about all this and I was like I had to make that choice at that moment to be that guy to be that guy but I felt like I looked out in this audience and I saw all these people like you know looking at me and they had spent all this money I knew what they spent Mm -hmm. and I said with all due respect to my fellow panelists I said everything that these guys have said not relevant not 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 a part of it and you could hear a pin drop. Oh, you could hear a pin drop from, from space. And it was what like, so what happened? What happened? This is good. So, so, so what happened? So they all were like, "Well, why don't you tell us?" And then they're man. like, "And what have you? <laughs> and what have you sold?" And I'm like, "Well, wait a second. And then we got into it. And oh, and then everyone was like, "Oh, I got my money's worth." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. That made the panel better. All of a sudden, one of the guys won an Emmy in 1975. God bless him. God bless him, but TV today is not TV in 1975. Jesus Christ. It's not three networks. It's, <laughs> you know right, what I mean? Right. So it's like, you know, talking about how to break in as a TV writer, I'm sorry. From, ni- from yeah, you know, I'm All in so- the Family was fantastic. Yes, I mean, okay. you know, <laughs> but- I think he won for like the freaking Rockford Files. Yes. God bless him. <laughs> I mean, God bless him. I hope to have one one day. I yeah. mean, he's got one more than I have, but <laughs> it's, you know, what is going on right now? So again, everything that we do on this side has to be, like people like Charlie, people like Jason, they're in the mix, they're doing it right now. I think Charlie actually sp- taught an eight-week lab for us. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the whole idea is to have the education be right now, to have these panels be right now. And then, you know, we also do a lot of, I, mean, I don't want to make it sound like everything we do is... Um, money related either because we do a lot of free mm-hmm. um not only free education but for example we did a um uh a deal with the uh st petersburg film commission mm-hmm. great guys they used to run the sun well he used to run the sunscreen film festival he has passed it off mm-hmm. um but he runs the, the the film commission and we were talking to ken and he was like we should do something i actually have a budget where i can uh give twenty thousand dollars to a film, a writer director to come down and make their short. You know, the, the short has to be written. It has to take place in, in St. Petersburg. So, mm-hmm. you know, they could just change the location to want to write something new, and we'll give them twenty grand to shoot, five grand to put up the cast and crew, and we'll distribute it to the festivals and stuff like that. We'll we'll try to get it out. Excuse me. Well, what the hell that was? Um, no, excuse me. We got to try to get that. That's out. okay. Elijah Wood could get away with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Elijah, Elijah did the same thing. I actually, I actually think it was High West Bourbon. Uh, yeah. But anyway, um, so we uh, we're we're now in the process of picking that film, 
And J.T. Molnar, who had a film here last year called Angels and Outlaws, and this is a perfect example yeah. of somebody doing it yeah, and yeah. giving Hold back, on. we went to him and said, what would you think about mentoring on set for a week, this young director? And he said, I'm in. So that's one example. You know, you'd be surprised at how many, and I know you know this well, oh, yeah. how many people in the industry are so willing they are. They give. are actually. Be- they they're are. just not asked. They're not, and they're honored they're, to be asked. They're, uh, they're just not. You'd be surprised at Oscar winners and and guys who've been in the business and have just just killed it. They're never asked. No. They're like, hey, would you like to teach a course? Hey, would you like to lecture? Hey, would you like to mentor somebody? Yeah, they're, it's amazing. It is amazing. It, it is really, is. and it's also amazing how many people. Like one of the other things we got approached on. Um, Approach to do recently. I was speaking at AFM and I got looked down at the panel, and this guy rushed the stage and he says, I have to talk to you about a co European uh, film commission. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Initiative, and I was like, the heck is this guy talking about? And it turned out that it was this really, really cool idea that he had where he works with all the European film commissions, they are looking for material, but they're looking for material to join forces on. They don't want to provide all the funding. They want to shoot, you know, maybe it's France and Sweden, maybe it's this, whatever. So again, we offered this for free. People were able to submit their projects. They had to have, have they had to have some sort of, maybe, maybe a little bit of the money in, or maybe some actors attached, you know, attached to it, some packaging a little bit. And then what we're doing is we're taking six of these uh, filmmakers or producers down to South by Southwest, all the European Film Commission uh, heads will be there, and we're going to try to package their films and get those films made uh, through our connections and through their connections, and that's free. So these are things that we're doing all the time, you know, and these are some of the success stories, too, you know, things that come out of, out of these programs that we put together. Well, I, th- I think that both you and I started our companies with the same mission statement, mm-hmm. to help. Yeah. You saw there was, uh, there was no social network mm-hmm. for creatives. Right. I felt that there was no real voice out there that was telling it how it is. Mm-hmm. It is. Mm-hmm. Like it really is. Not from someone who's up in the ivory tower. I'm still, I always use this analogy. Mm-hmm. I'm at the bottom of Blade Runner. I'm there eating the ramen noodles. Yeah, yeah. With everything. I'm not up with the owl. Right. You know, I visit the owl every once in a while, but I don't live up there. I live down here. Right. Which is much more colorful and entertaining yeah. down here. And the, and the food's and better. It, the food is better. <laughs> but, um, but because I wanted to give a perspective of someone who was in the fight scratching and, and and who's been around the block a few times yeah. and that's why i wanted to give and you did the same thing you you're trying to give access yeah. and give connections and stuff and i'm trying to give knowledge and i think that's we both come from a good place that's why i think we're both you know growing as fast as we have been no I, I agree with that and i think that you know we also surround ourselves obviously with mm-hmm. people that have the same mentality uh, mentality yeah. and, the, and the same passion and that want to get back well and, i mean sebastian's class at USC. Well, and the show. All yeah, and the show, all of it. Yeah, he's the same way. It's all way. pay it forward. That's yeah, it's about it. paying it forward and trying to help. I want to make it easier uh, for people. I, I, I actually teach the class that I wish I had. That's number one. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. really cool. I, yeah, that's it is. Really it's cool. Because I spend a lot of time making mistakes or learning the hard way, and I can just tell people very quickly this is the way to do it. It's just up to everyone to listen, hopefully. There's always that. <laughs> Char- Charlie and Jason, actually, we go way back together. So, so they, cool. They, 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 they listened. And the, one, the other thing about the business, I think, and I think you guys will both agree, it's very small. Oh, it is. People know each other. Everybody is so small. It's, it, it's so big, but yet everybody does know each other. Well, and again, that's actually a, a good point, again, to come full circle with the relationship thing. One of the, when we went to go attach this director to the film that's at Cover right now, mm. he had a producing partner. His producing partner is one of my best friends from Vegas. Unbeknownst to me, the script was there. And I had, I was, ironically enough, because I signed the deal right before Sundance last year, I was telling him about the deal mm-hmm. here last mm-hmm. year. Mm-hmm. It's probably, you know, the fifth or sixth Sundance that we had hung out together. And then all of a sudden he calls me up one day and he says, your freaking script's on my desk. I think this is happening. Okay? <laughs> Friendships and relationships. And then, you know, we had to go to bat for one another because there were other people involved. Well, that's the it, other yeah. thing. It, 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 it does take time. Like you can know a lot of people. I, I mean, I've kind of been in the business for a while. I know a lot of people, but it's still hard. And it takes time. You still need more than one person sometimes. And, and you just have to yeah, be okay. patient. Is that true? Um, like I actually did. I really wanted to meet you. And um, 
uh, it, it, it's happened, you know, mm. and you just have to stay in it long enough and just keep pushing. Take the rejection. There's often a lot of rejection, or sometimes it's that silent no, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, because everyone's Which is busy. Hollywood's really and it's good. not always just it's a really good rejection. <laughs> you know, it takes time to get people on board to make things happen, and yeah. so somehow it got to him and got, and now he's on board because it takes more than one person sometimes to to make things. Work. Isn't isn't it true that Hollywood gives the best fu's on? Anywhere. Well, they kill you with kindness. It's just kindness. amazing. Kindness. I've never, you know, New York, different. They'll just tell you straight oh, up. Oh, right to your face. Like, this sucks. Why, why are you in my office? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally true. You know, we're going a different direction right yeah. now. It's not you. It's a, you know, yeah, yeah, but that's what I'm saying. It's a full <laughs> education of how to navigate this business. It really is. Yeah. Like, you know, the first time that I got, it, it's not, it's, it's really good, but it's not for me. I went back 10 times and said, well, why not? <laughs> and, and finally, this guy said to me, he was a producer, Dude, and he finally, like, no, he finally said to me, he goes, listen, he goes, you seem like a really nice guy. He goes, and, and the writing actually isn't bad. He goes, so I'm going to give you a lesson, uh-huh. okay? Somebody says to you, it's not for them. They don't want to make it. Let it go. Let it go. Go to the next person until you get, yes, yeah. it's, it's for me. You well, know? I agree on that, you know, because it's interesting. People always ask, like, why did somebody pass? Like, uh, and, oh. and really... Um, the, whatever reason they give you isn't the real reason anyway. A pass is a pass, basically. It doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> and it doesn't matter. The, the, the point is if they really loved it, then they would start talking to you about it. And everyone's going to pass for different reasons. Mm-hmm. It's often subjective or maybe it's business or this or that. And so it's not like you can figure out why somebody's passing and then go and rewrite it and then, hey, and then they'll pass for another. You can't do that. A pass is a pass. Yeah. Um, but things can still change. They come around. This is why I'm going to go back to that Sheldon Candace quote. Sheldon had a film here called um, Love, L-U-V, at Sundance. And he, he said this thing. It's called, he said, no is only no for now. Uh, it's a good and, quote. And I think that's true because sometimes people say no because they can't, they, they, you know, you, you think somebody can help you because they're in a certain position, like they've had produced movies at Sundance, but that doesn't mean that they can produce yours right away. So they might say no, but um, maybe somebody you get it to somebody else that's a friend of theirs, and now they both happen to agree on it. That no can turn to a yes. That's what I was saying. Like it, it takes time because it usually takes more than one person. There are very few people that can just green light something, and even if they're passionate about you. You know, agents get no's all the time. Agents here know more than anybody because they represent all these clients. Like, you know, agents at major agencies have, you know, might be surprising to know, like 75 to 100 clients each. They hear no constantly, mm-hmm. right? So it's, 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 it's difficult. And it just, it just takes time. You just have, it's perseverance, meeting a lot of people, you know, helping a lot of people. And it, it, it will eventually happen if you can stay in it long enough and just kind of find a way to deal with um, the hardship along the way. Well, and that, that speaks to what you were saying earlier about the endurance part of it. And, Oof. you know, you got to stay in the game. It really does only take one yes. And the reasons, like you were saying, Sebastian, the, the, the no's are, it could be anything. I mean, it really can. It could be the material's not connecting. It could be that I don't do movies in this budget range. I don't see. It, it could be a million It could reasons. be a politics at the place, at the uh, production company, at the, st- it could be a million things. It could be anything. You can't, it's out of your control. It, and it's out of your control, but what is in your control is, and that's why I love what you call it in the film, Hustle, because yes. it's the hustle. And you know, that's another thing I get all the time. As soon as I signed with, with David, people were like, oh, you have a manager now. You must, this is so great. Now you just get to go right. And I'm like, yeah. are you out of your freaking mind? Do your mind? hands hurt from counting the money? Yeah. I mean, well, right? it's, not even, it's not even the counting, it's not even the money. Right, it's, it's, right, the, right. it's the, you know, he's concentrating on one project. Right. I have to be out there pushing my other projects. I still have to be out there making relationships. He's right. not out at parties saying, hey, you got to meet, well, let me call him. Well, he has other guys he reps, too. You, yeah. A couple I mean, of big you know, guys, too. Well, I, yeah, he's, <laughs> he's rep Shane Black since 84. He, he, so, he, he sold Lethal Weapon. So that's how far back he goes. He's like Yoda. <laughs> he is. He really is. Like, he'll tell me things, not just them. You're like, wow. Yeah, like, wow, like, master. You know, <laughs> half of them don't make much sense. Sorry, David. No, 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 no. Not now, but in 10 Even years. Ten years. That, you can read about him. He's in that new CA book, uh, Powerhouse. They mentioned him yeah, in there. And I yep. think he's in the mailroom, too. You can mm-hmm. read about oh, he's, him. I mean, he's such an interesting. He's a legend. He's a legend. Yeah. And he's an interesting cat. But, you know, David will say to me, like, you know, when, when we first got interest on uh, the end game, which is the script, that's at Covert, he said to me, he goes, look, he goes, you're, he goes, I know you hate this. He goes, because you're not a producer on this. He goes, I know you hate this. He said, but your job here is done, okay? 
you need to keep going writing or getting out there and networking, getting out there and pushing and getting out there and making your contacts mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. figuring out. He goes, I'll help you figure out what, if you think that this script is ready, where it might be able to go. He, but you figure that out, too, you know, and that was I, I, I've been around it long enough that it wasn't so eye opening. But it's interesting to hear, see other people's uh, or hear other people's perspectives on it and people like, oh, my God, like. All I want is a manager because then it's just going to become so easy. I'm like, no, you work twice no. as hard, really, in a lot of ways. You're going to work twice as hard. Can you talk a little bit about the, the myth of the agent and the manager? Mm-hmm. Because so many people think the second they get an agent or a manager, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's easy. It's easy you, you could just go. Yeah. And the one thing I've realized with agents and managers, but more agents than managers, is that you need to, they're only going to take you on if they think they can make some money, money with you. Yeah. Well, there's because a reason they only make 10%, you know. Do you know the saying? No, what? Why they only get ten percent? No, because you, the writer, are doing ninety percent of the work. work. Yeah, exactly. So that's what he was talking about. Yeah. So that's why a lot of these young, you know, people who are on, on, on stage or two or listen um, or are part of any film hustle, is that they're like, oh, I just need to get a manager. I'm like, but what are you, what are you providing? Right. I've been in, I've been in meetings with agents and managers that are like, you know, your short's really nice, but come back to me when you have a feature. Yeah. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Or come back to me when you have, you know, two or three scripts. Because it's like, they don't want to have to do the work unless they know that the percentages of them actually making some money with you is high. Do you agree? Oh, totally agree. And I think that, I think it's one of the most underexplored areas in the business is the manager-writer relationship. And sometimes the manager-director or agent-director relationship. But if we're talking about writers, um... Well, again, all these conferences I speak at, a lot of it's about the craft, and there's so much on the craft, and, and you can drive yourself nuts. You really <laughs> have to know the business. So again, part of the reason we're doing this online conference, we're calling it the, the craft and business of screenwriting, and one of the panels is the manager-writer uh, relationship, because again, I just feel like it's completely underserved and, and underexplored. But here are some of the myths, okay? One is that this idea that you have to, the first offer you get, that you have to take it, that the, that the manager... Uh, that you work for the manager, basically. Like, you know, like, it's, it's this deal that, like, oh, my God, like, I'm, I'm being, I have attention on me. Like, you know what I mean? So, like, of course, I'm going to sign with whoever. I passed on three managers. I had three offers. I passed on all three of them. There was a reason for all three. One, for example, was that they wanted to pigeonhole me, and I felt like that was a little, it was a little early for that. I know you're supposed to write in your niche and everything. I have my own opinions on that. But I felt like it was a little early when nothing had been optioned or sold, Okay. Um, another one kept talking about where I fit in her roster. And I was like, shouldn't the writing be the writing? Why why is it where I fit? You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? That doesn't make much sense to me. If you think you could sell me, you could sell me. Okay. So I tell people all the time, you don't have to go home with the first girl that, you know, (laughs) pays you a little attention. You don't have to, right? So that's but that also comes with being confident who you are. Well, but it also comes in knowing the business, right? Mm -hmm. What is this person that like for example, like I've had writer friends that have been like, I sign with so and so and I'm like, well who is this person? And I Google them and you know, they were an actor an actor or an actress and now they're gonna go, but what have they done? Or I'll say to some, you know, they're like, I don't know if I want to sign with them. Like, have you gone to their client list? And Mm -hmm. ask them. You know, say to the agent, say to the manager, can I, or I mean, obviously you can see it on IMDb Pro or whatever, but go out and, and solicit their opinions. If a manager gets pissed off at that, that's the wrong person anyway, right? right? It's the same thing with sales agents, by the way. Go to, all their, go to all their clients and find out, you know, all the people that they've worked with and find out, were they good? Did they do their job? Mm-hmm. Um, but with writers, it's, it's this thing, again, it's this idea, this sort of romantic thing that I get to run around and tell people I have a manager. And the reality of the situation is the wrong manager will set your career back years. Mm -hmm. I mean, legitimately, it will set you back years because you're going to get bad information. They don't have the clout to sell you sometimes. They're going to want you to rewrite everything six billion times because they can't waste the rock. A lot of waste of time. It's a lot of waste of time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with David, for example, I said to him, you know, obviously his reputation spoke for himself, but it did kind of concern me that he, he reps so few writers. And a lot of them are people that have been with him for a long time. He very, very rarely signs a new writer. So I had to say to him, like, how much work are you really going to do? Hmm. Like, you know what I mean? Because, you know, you kind of, Shane Black turns into something, <laughs> fine, we're going. What is, you know, it's not too difficult for him to pick up the phone and, you know, whatever. But if I'm coming in, nobody, you, nobody knows me. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, and we had to have that conversation. 
And he was very honest about it. He was like, this is where I feel like you're going to sit. This is what I feel like we could do first. This is what I feel like we could do second. And in the meantime, while we're doing those two things, you better go work your ass off. And I said, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the blunt, you know, uh, honesty. honesty. And that's why I signed with him. I didn't sign with him because he was Shane Black's manager. Believe me. I signed with him because he had a vision for me. And he's held up to that, you know? He actually, and it was good for me too, because unlike some other managers who want to be in your face 24 seven, he gives me a little bit more freedom to roam a little bit, a little bit more time to get to where I need to get with a piece of material or whatever. And that works. So I, you know, so some of the myths are, like I said, that you need to have somebody right away. First of all, even the idea that you need to have one right away in this day and age when you can kind of reach anybody, if you're doing your marketing the right way, I know plenty of people who have sold scripts that had, did not have a manager at the time, and some of them still don't. I know some of the people that have sold 10 scripts that have a manager and have no agent. They handle their stuff on their own, or they have an entertainment attorney that acts as an agent because mm-hmm. they pick up the phone and make calls. There's a million different ways to go about this. You just have to know what you want for yourself. And then, like I said, then once you have a manager, of course, the biggest myth and the thing that people forget is that they work for you. You don't work for them. And sometimes they need to be reminded of that. <laughs> Every once in a blue moon, you need to pick up the phone and go, hey, motherfucker, <laughs> remember me? You know? Um, but that's, that's the truth. You know, I've seen that too. I have a friend that, uh, you know, we, our, our offices are on the, um, uh, the, the old Worldly Studio lot in Manhattan Beach. I think it's called Manhattan Beach Studio now. I think mm-hmm. James Cameron bought it and, uh, and then left. James Cameron bought it to do Avatar and then Avatar 2 and then took the entire freaking thing down to New Zealand. But anyway, <laughs> um, so we have a nice empty lot. And, but the, uh, the, the office I work in or the building I work in is a lot of creatives. It's a lot of directors mm-hmm. and writers and everything. And I have a writer friend who uh, wrote a couple of features that got produced. He's written some TV stuff. And you know, one day we were just sitting down having a drink and he said to me, he goes, you know, he goes, As I'm just sitting here talking to you. He goes, it just it hit me that I have not talked to my manager in six months. Oh, holy cow. He goes, six months. And he said, I got it. I guess I either have to make a switch or I need to. So you had to have that, you know, come to Jesus conversation. And, you know, they kind of got back on the same page again. But he had to say to him, like, you, I think you forget that you, you work for me. me. And all of a sudden, he got him into a couple of rooms. He actually did get him a writing assignment. And, but, you know, you but, he had, but he had to push. Yeah, yeah but that's, well, yeah, but it, it, is, it is a two way street. You have to engage with no your doubt. man. That's why it's like no chemistry doubt. is a huge thing. They have to like you. <laughs> that's number one. And number two, you can't put all your eggs in one basket. So, you know, if you have one script, you, have, you should have other ideas for scripts. You should also bounce ideas. It is a two way mm-hmm. street. So, like that story that you say, it's a good story, but it also, uh, you know, Makes me wonder why did he let that? Why did he let it go? And he, listen, yeah. he took he took responsibility as well. He yeah. said, you know, I could have picked up the phone. I think that you hit upon something else that I think is not so much a myth of the relationship, mm-hmm. but but something that writers need to realize if you're just starting out. One is if you have one idea, you need to finish that script. You know, people. I, I think I tweeted this a couple of weeks ago because I had somebody come to me, and every time it, it happens all the time, but every mm-hmm. time it does, it like a little piece of me dies. Is when <laughs> somebody says to me, "I've been working on this script for like the last five years." Oh god. And I'm like, yeah, we okay. all have those friends, you know. Yeah, and we'll it's not, have, no, it's not, no. you know. I just want it to be perfect. Well, it's never going to be. Perfect. It's it's a it's this romantic idea. Or you don't have another idea, but that leads me There's into that. my point, which is even if you think you have one good script and you said it, they're always going to ask, "What's next? What else do you have? What else do you got?" And even if you've written that great first script and they really love it, and somebody really wants to produce it, or somebody wants to manage you because of it, they're still not going to take you on because they're not going to be sure that you're a one-trick pony. They're going to want to know you're not a one-trick pony. You know what I mean? Like maybe you just hit the right idea and you were able to pull it off. You I, know? I, use, I use baseball analogies a lot, and I think this is a perfect baseball analogy. Uh, you get that one script, that's your one swing up a bat. Mm-hmm. You might hit a home run, right. but the game's still going. That's right. So you better have a couple more swings in you. Right. Now, you can hit singles with those swings. Right. You can strike out. Right. But you got to have other swings. If not, the game is over. Yeah, you need to have, right? I mean, legitimately, you need that. It's a great one. I mean, legitimately, you should have, you know, three or four, I think at least three. Three, three scripts. Three scripts. Not ideas, because we all have, have ideas. ideas. <laughs> I, I think three is where, you know, three is Well, nice. ideally, I think also you should be maybe, if you can, because life takes its own courses, you know, you know write two scripts a year, ideally. Yeah. Yeah, if you can, yeah. But but I think what I'm saying is before you go out, even like you oh, know, yeah. you know, and try to even get a manager to engage with you or whatever, I think you should have. I mean, could you get away with two? You might if you've written something really fantastic. Um, but ideally, probably. Three. Well, then you got to put yourself out there to other contests. Like Austin, we mentioned is mm-hmm. great. Nickel, 
Uh, actually, one of my friends won it, which was cool for comedy. Oh, actually, a couple friends. Another one for sci-fi. You know, Nickel Fellowship, Blacklist, mm-hmm. Slam Dance does a really great genre one. Mm-hmm. Um, they're they're very you know script pipeline. There's there's, there's a few. The one that you mentioned, mm-hmm. it, they they you have to put yourself out there. Yeah, as long, and that's investing in yourself. Yeah, and again, it has to be that it provides access. You know, if you win, right. or if you're a finalist, you know, one of the things we do with all our finalists, for example, is they their log lines get sent to all the executives. You know, but the the winners, of course, the, fi- the actual finalists, you know, they get put in front of everybody. Uh, we fly them out. We get them in front of everybody and whatever. But just if you make the finals, you get your log line exposed. And we've gotten plenty of reads off of that. Plenty mm-hmm. of people have said, I want to you know, request that script, I want that script, I want that script. It really is all about having that access, and it's about investing in yourself. It really is. Now, the other, the other thing I want to talk about real quick is a lot of stuff that we talk about is about getting access and, and, and going to those decision makers. In today's world, um, I come from a point, like with This Is Meg, I didn't wait. Right. I just said, you know what? I'm just going to get up and go and do it. Uh, and there is that, there is a place for those kind of things. Like if I'm going to write a script, I'm going to write a script that I can go make mm-hmm. and get attention that way and not wait for somebody. Because you, know, you and I, all of us know that waiting could be years. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. It could be years. Absolutely. And when I went into the making of This Is Meg, I'm like, I don't care if it's good, bad. I'm just going to make it. And we'll see what happens. Mm-hmm. And things are starting to come out of it. Mm-hmm. Do you agree with that? Like in today's world that you could just go and go make a short. Go you know, take a script that you wrote. You know, if you, you think you believe in your writing, go partner with a director. Mm-hmm. There's a few of them out here. <laughs> Especially if you live in L.A. You know, there's plenty of opportunities for you to pick up. You know, and get a maybe a, maybe a five hundred bucks, a grand, and go make something, yeah. and well, get that ball rolling. It doesn't even. I mean, you could make a web series. You could make shorts. Anything. Got short, everything. It's content. Stuff, people look content. for that. Every Hollywood combs through all of that. They but, really do. But do you agree with that? Because there is the option of trying to go out there, taking those meetings. Because I've been there. You've been there. You've been there. We've all been there. Mm-hmm. Um, I got tired of waiting. You know, after I got dropped from the last project that was attached, I was like, I'm I'm done. Mm. I'm not twenty anymore. Yeah, I gotta go. And that's when Meg was born. And, and now I got other things I'm going to be doing. And keeping that mentality, that kind of the Rocky mentality. Yeah. You're in the streets, you're in the gutter, and I'm not – if I get there, great. And if they come knocking, great, but I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. Yeah. Do you agree with that kind of mentality? Totally, 100%. It's a DIY world. Proof of concept today, web series, shorts, is almost as big as you know going out and making a feature. If you're, if you're somebody that, that isn't known yet, especially – somebody that's looking to get some sort of attention, that's how you get your the attention is by creating work and getting it out there. Mm-hmm. Now, I could tell you two years ago or three years ago, when I talked to managers and agents, like when we were bringing in people again for like the Happy Writer Services, for example, and we would ask them what kind of material they were looking for, you would never hear shorts and web series. Web series. And web. Now, I got people calling me up all the time going, who do you know on the site? What do you see? I even had lunch with an agent. I mean, this is how much it's changed. About maybe a month ago or two months ago. And he was, he was an agent for filmmakers. He, he, does, he handles directors and, uh, and some writers. And uh, he said, I almost feel guilty sitting here having lunch. He said, because I have literally taken lunches where my phone blows up because there was something posted on like Vimeo short corner and like 10 people are bidding on this, you know, the filmmaker, like, you know, for the, for the, I mean, it's crazy, but everybody with all the content that's being created, all right, when we had 466, I think, original shows this year on yeah. television, mm-hmm. okay, where we have, you know, live in a world where Whiplash wins best short at Sundance one year and comes back the next year and wins best, you know, best film, mm-hmm. you know, for a feature, uh, and that somebody actually gave the money, Bowl gave them the money, and you know, say, okay, if you want to make it as a feature, you can, and that paid off. When we live in that kind of world, you have no excuse. And when you can pick up your phone and, and film something, and, Tangerine. You, know, you know, all day, you, there's no excuse not to be doing it now. And if you're sitting there complaining about the process, then you're not doing anything to help yourself. You're done. You know what I mean? If you're complaining, you're done. Yeah. It's just, it's too difficult of a business. You can't, you gotta, you, you can't complain. You just gotta. But again, how do you, how do you draw attention to yourself? How do you stand out? So this is where we started, right? How do you, if, if, if 500 people sign up for stage 32 a day, okay, every single one of those 500 people are looking to do something. They, all, they have a goal. 
Okay, they're there to either be seen, mm -hmm. they're there to raise money, they're there to find projects to put money into. Mm -hmm. Everybody has something they're looking to do. The question becomes right there, how do you stand out from the other $4.99? What do you do that's different? And part of that process like, is everything we talked about earlier, the approach and how you handle your, you know, your business and your networking and all that stuff. But the other part of it is what are you creating and what are you doing and what are you, how are you standing out in that way? Who are you collaborating with? Like you said, you're a writer. Well, okay, you have a half million people on this site. A lot of them are directors. A lot of them are posting in the job section saying, hey, I'm actually looking for material to put something together. It's not going to be high budget. It's going to be a few thousand dollars, but let's do it together. Well, go do it. Mm -hmm. Get involved. You know, one of the beautiful things in a way about, one of the cool things you said about, what, you know, about the success stories, and I went right to the Oscars and all that, but I'm going to tell you one that I found to be fascinating. There was a composer who uh, lived in Florida. She's gotten 21 okay. gigs off of Stage 32. She, a producer in India and a filmmaker in India, came to her and said, you know, would you score, I would like to show you, and this is human trafficking short and whatever, and she came to me, and I, I'm, you know, I'm very selective, and I don't have a lot of time, so it's like you know, about what I produce, what I get involved with. But I said, you know, this is really kind of interesting. And he had, like, I think he had a cinematographer, I think from Denmark or something. So he was an Indian producer, filmmaker, composer in, now in L.A., he's originally from Florida, me, and this other guy from somewhere in Europe, and um, made this really great, Short, and we all kind of banded together to help get the little bit of money that needed to be brought in, um, and you know, get the, the, the people for post and everything like that. That's a huge success story to me. And this is a filmmaker now off of this short, he's gotten offered a whole bunch of things, he's won a couple of film festivals with it, and it's that that's powerful. But he he asked. This this is happening. You know, my favorite story. This isn't a stage thirty two, but it, it, it it's what you. Well, represent. I'm leaving then. No, no, no. <laughs> but my favorite story. There's this web series. It's uh, Bat in the Sun, and they do superpower beatdown where they have like Batman versus Darth Vader. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, like okay. mm -hmm. So I know Aaron. And, I know those um, guys. Yeah. And I and I asked him. Uh, I said, you know, who does your visual effects? Because if you see Batman versus oh Vader, no, I saw like, what are the, it's gorgeous. Ten, ten million plus. Well, first of all, concept Batman versus it's Darth Vader. I, mean, that's I said, badass. who does your visual effects? You know, who? How, how many people? Are, he said, well, well, it's me. First of all, I'm doing it because he's in a lot of them. My dad, and uh, his dad helps him tremendously. And he said, the third person is um, we we found this guy just through the net, and he does the visual effects. I said, okay, well, well, who is he? And he said, well, he's in the Ukraine. Um, and he's in a wheelchair, and uh, he just got so deep into working on effects and stuff because that was his outlet. And they found each other through the net, and that's how that's the guy that does his visual effects. I'm like, this is incredible mm -hmm. that this is happening now. That you, you cross. That's why the I world the idea like international boundaries. So I think Stage Thirty Two is fantastic because all over the world you can. They don't have to just be in L.A. They don't even have to just be in whatever city you're from. You know, you, you yeah. can find people from all over the world now, and you just use Dropbox or whatever it is that you do, and you can still, you can make projects with people wherever they are. I mean, I get contacted from people from all around oh. the world. It's amazing. Sometimes I get emails or messages, I'm like, wow. Like some guy. And you provided a platform and, for that. Do you know how many people are international? Oh, God, a ton. I mean, it's like 50, I think that we're like 58% U.S. or North America, and then... All over. I mean, UK is huge. South yeah. Africa is growing. Yeah, yeah. Australia, 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 New Zealand. Yeah, yeah, New Zealand. true. But you know, here, yeah. but you know, you made a great point, right? This is something that happens on the all the on on the site all the time as well on the platform. You know, like I said earlier, you get to people who say like, "Well, what am I going to get out of it?" Like that kind of thing. But here's another one, and it freaking drives me nuts because it's like, okay, again, if you have that this kind of attitude, you're never going to succeed. I live in pick anything, Chicago. I'm getting network requests from filmmakers in, you know, South Africa. Why the hell do I need those connections? Why do I need... And I sit there and go, man, alive. Like, if you don't know, <laughs> if you don't understand, have you done your research? Have you done... Have you looked... In fact, I, I actually left this part out. I just realized it just now. It clicked. But the first agent that contacted me about the end game after it was a Montreal agent, okay? And my first reaction when I got that phone call was... I don't even have representation in L.A. <laughs> Why would I be talking to this guy? But if I did not call that person back, this would, the film would not be happening. Okay? You never know. You, you don't know, and you don't know who knows who, and you don't know who's rising up, 
and you don't know. Hey, listen, one of the very first success stories we had on Stage 32, I mean, was, I'm talking like maybe a week in, was maybe this was the Denmark, uh, but whatever it was. He was I was in Sweden or whatever, but the, the filmmaker in L.A., he had done a bunch of films, and he was doing this film noir thing that he, he just, he, the composers he worked with, the people he worked with, just couldn't get it. Just couldn't get it. So he looked at the platform and he said, I'm going to put out, he put me to post. And he said, I'm going to up, whoever's interested, I will send you three scenes. You score them. If I like them, I'm going to hire you. You're going to get paid. And you're going to do the whole film. And it was a guy, it was a guy in Sweden, who had mm. never done a film before. He had done shorts, but he had right. never done anything like this, right? He basically won the day. He ended up scoring this film. This was like back in 2011. Got paid for it. Never left. Never, they never... Met. Never mm-hmm. met. Mm-hmm. He scored mm-hmm. the film they had. This film got theatr- you know, theatrical release and whatever, and now he's, he scored the next two films for him. That's what I'm talking about. So, I mean, no connection's a bad connection. The creativity is happening. You know, you're filming in one place. You're doing posts over here. You're doing, right. I mean, everything is happening across the globe. Mm-hmm. And if you're going to have that sort of closed-mindedness to this, you're just shooting yourself in the foot. You're just closing, again, you're closing roads. And I have this whole saying of how do you open roads every day? How do you clear roads every day for yourself? Mm-hmm. And sometimes, and you said it very well, it, it, it's, it's a marathon. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So you have to win every day, right? You have to find a way every day to, to take another step forward. And if you're going to have that kind of closed mind, closed mind then this is never going to happen. I mean, imagine when you launched Stage 32, you, had, you called 100 of your friends. Yeah. If you would have thought, like, man, why am I not to half a million already? Mm. You would have oh. never gotten there. Same thing with me. I, I hope I pop, I pop up a podcast. Mm. Nobody knows who the hell I am. Mm. And just by doing it every day, twice a week, mm. pop, 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 all of a sudden it starts to grow. You show up to work every day, something will happen. That's right. Either that's writing, it's a directing, whatever. And if you handle yourself with integrity, too, which you do. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's being honest. It's being... Uh, like you said, true to yourself, but it's also being true to your audience. Mm-hmm. And it's also, I mean, in a lot of ways, it's practice what you preach kind of thing too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, know, you got to lead by example. Again, it's one of the reasons why that welcome message is there. It's basically saying, you're going to see, like people will say all the time, like, you have to have somebody doing all those posts for you. <laughs> right, like, you yeah. know, I think my, one of my programmers told me the other day that, you know, or a couple of months ago that I have made over like 300,000 posts in, in, in five years or something like mm-hmm. that. And people are always like, oh, they, they can't all be you. No, they're all me. Mm-hmm. They are all me. Yeah, same here. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it has it ha- to be. It has to be. So, you know, but again, that's putting in the time. That's being committed. Mm-hmm. That, you know, I, for lack of a better way of putting it, treating it like a job and saying that I have to do this, okay, um, because it's going to benefit me and it's going to benefit the community. Last question. Sure. What uh, is the best advice you give for someone starting out? Besides signing up the stage thirty two, well, listening to the Indie Film Podcast, that. exactly and watching right. the Insiders. That's exactly. Well, <laughs> what else do you? What else do you need? <laughs> no, I think the best advice is a lot of the advice that we've put out here today, which is you have to. It's not just about the work. It's you know the work is going to carry you so far. It's the relationships and and the uh, friendships you make that are going to lead to the success that you want to have. Yeah. And like I said, my approach every day is without being cliched, is to really win every day, but it's always about how do I move stage 32 along a little bit? How do I move my writing and producing along a little bit? How, like all these little things that I desire to do, all these paths that I'm looking to take and be successful in, mm-hmm. how do I push them along so that when I go to bed at night, I say, made some progress there, made some progress there. The other thing I would just say really, really quickly is know the business, Every morning I get up, know, have your routines, have your, you know, have your, know, know what works for you. Don't, you don't have to read 10,000 books that tell you you have to do this, you have to do that. You know what you have to do, okay? You know what you have to do for whatever your chosen craft is, all right? If you're a screenwriter, you know, there are certain things that you could read. If you're a filmmaker and you want to read the Lumet, you know, the Sidney Lumet book. Which or, is an amazing Which is great, but I'm saying if you want to do that, you want to do that, it's fine. But be your own person, be your own, you know, figure it out for yourself, but... Have your routines. And what I mean by that is every morning I get up, every morning, okay, and the first thing I do after I make my coffee is read the trades. I want to know what's going on in the business every day. Now, I enjoy doing it. It's not a job to me, but I do look at it like it's my job, okay? Because if I'm not, if I don't know, then I don't know, 
Okay, and somebody's going to call me out at some point, or there's going to be something that I'm not, you know, or there might be an angle in. So that's part of my routine every single day, no matter where I am, if I'm at Sundance or I'm home, it doesn't matter. That gets me into the mindset, the proper mindset for the day. And what I do with a lot of the information, by the way, also, a lot of the articles I like, repost, should put them on social media. Mm-hmm. I do a weekend blog every weekend, you know, Arby's weekend blog, where I have articles from the industry and, you know, uh, lounge discussions from the site and everything like that. I do that because I want to give back. It's a mm-hmm. pain in the ass to do it. It really is, <laughs> collecting all that information. But I do it to give back. Do the same thing. Read that stuff. Get that stuff. If you read the, if you read the Sunil May book, tell people how great it was. Tell people why you liked it. Mm-hmm. Just, just be out there. Be visible. There's another saying we say on the site, and we'll leave it with this. Be active and be visible, okay? If you're, act, if you're well, first of all, if you're visible, if you're going to be active, you're going to be visible. But I'm saying be out there. Be, you know, a citizen of the community you're in. Yep. And give as much, give more than you take. Mm-hmm. Ask more of, ask, let people ask you uh, more than you ask of them. Ask more of you than you ask of them. If that made sense. Does that make sense? Made perfect sense. Made perfect sense. I like it. Yeah. Thank you, sir, so much for your time. I know you're Thank a busy, you busy you. man here at Sundance. Yes. Well, no, this is a thrill, man. And you know I love everything that we do together. So, and, and this is a pleasure. So. Thank you. I'm yeah. really happy yeah. to meet Thank you. Thank you, much. Pleasure. pleasure. Thank, you. It, Thank you, guys. It's always a pleasure to have RB on the show. You know, he is on the, the pulse of what's going on in the indie film business and in, in the business in general with Stage 32 and having half a million um, members on Stage 32. And if you guys haven't checked out Stage 32, definitely give it a shot, man. These guys have, they're basically, a Forbes called them the LinkedIn for um, filmmakers and for creatives. So actors, directors, um, writers, and so on. Connect. And there's a lot of people that you can connect with, you know, network, and and just you know meet other people who are doing what you're doing. It's pretty uh, pretty amazing. I'm a member of it as well. So just head over to stage32.com for more info on that. So, guys, it has been a whirlwind Sundance for me. Uh, I, I created all of these, all this content with, again, very big shout outs to Sebastian Tordas for helping me uh, put this whole thing together. And also Adam Bowman from Media Circus PR, which, uh, you know, without them, we wouldn't have been able to do this. So, thank you guys so, so much. If you want to get more information on Sebastian, just go to SebastianTordas.com. I'll put it in the show notes. And also um, MediaCircusPR.com if you're looking for public, uh, you know, a publicist for your film, getting the word out, getting interviews, getting press for your movie. So thanks again, guys, so, so much. Tomorrow will be the last one of the series, and then I get to rest for two or three days, <laughs> and then I'll start my normal routine next week with some cool interviews. I've got some really cool interviews uh, in the in the bank that I'll be uh, giving you guys out. And some cool topics I'll be talking about as well. So if you want to get links to anything I've talked about in this episode, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 136 for the show notes. So keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 